Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. When we visited Tom Renner and his collection of antique farm machinery near St. Louis, we weren't able to fit it all into two episodes. This third show will feature more of Tom's collection, including his vast array of walking plows. These are different type of plows. Uh, some were used as, uh, as lister plows and that. Um, uh, they're not really potato plows like a lot of people think. I mean, you could probably use them that way, but the potato plow was shaped like the lister plow, except it had raw holes in it or rods on it that the dirt could fall through and the potatoes would lay loose. These are primarily lister plows. This is a slat bottom plow right here, and this was used predominantly for sticky black soils or clay soils where the moldboard wouldn't scour properly and that. And uh, when you had the slats out, you put twice the amount of square inches of pressure on, on the slatted part right here and it would have a better chance of scouring in those sticky soils. These two plows right here are early, early prairie plows. Uh, this one here is a little later, it's actually got a rolling cutter on it. Might not have actually come with a rolling cutter, but somebody's added it. The one next to it doesn't have a rolling cutter, it's actually got like a knife and uh, I'm sure that was better than the no colder at all, uh, but it had to present some problems when you were in grass. But that was basically when the prairie was settled, this was what we had to plow with. And uh, this bar on the side, when you got to the end, you flopped the plow over and it rolled on that bar while you made your headland and came back again. This is a smaller pony plow. Here again, this is a John Deere, an original John Deere, you can see there. Uh, uh, it's a, a lister plow and that, another pony plow, followed by another pony plow. This is basically a little plow you'd use in the garden for, for putting in a row, whether it be uh, peas or whatever, and that it was just a hand cultivator. This is a horse-drawn cultivator, and basically you steered it with your hands, you moved the shovels in and out, and uh, if your horse was a little off to the side and that, you could you could move your shovels to get back and forth. Uh, totally wooden frame, except for the uh, steel up there on the, on the wheels and that, but uh, a very, very early cultivator. This is uh, a John Deere left-hand plow. Doesn't have a colder, has a jointer on it, and that, um, uh, not completely rare, but, but very, not very common either, uh, being left-handed. Uh, another John Deere plow. This is your potato plow. It's a lot of times confused with that lister plow over there. Basically, you went down your row. This shovel right here heaved the potatoes up. The dirt fell through, and the potatoes were supposedly laying on the top of the ground. It was pretty common. Almost every farmstead had one of those because most everybody raised their own potatoes. This is a John Deere rollover plow. And that. Uh, and basically when you got to the end, you kicked that latch and you went right back in the same furrow and that. Uh, eliminate all the furrows in the field. Basically you start on one side of the field and you just turn right around and went right across the field all the way. Uh, another John Deere plow. This is a really a rare plow here. They call this a rod plow and that, uh, there again it was for uh, soils that were very sticky. Uh, some people used them in soddy conditions and that. Um, these teeth right here were supposed to <clears throat> let it float and uh, yeah, it, uh, uh, it was a very early plow that basically had a use in special places, special soil types. Here again this is an old prairie plow for turning that, that stubborn sod over. No rolling colder, uh, very early version, 
and that long mold board, which gave it that supposed to lighten the draft and made it a little bit easier pulling. But I'm sure with the sod, it, it still had to be a load for a team of horses. This is a molding plow here, a little later plow, got a colder on it. Right, I like, basically, I like to remember it as it was when I was a kid, you know, with, I don't care if it, if it was a stove out of the house, if it was a wood-fired stove, you know, an old, old fan, an old, old chandelier, old butchering equipment, or anything like that that was, that was related to the farm. I'm not a big furniture collector, unless it was a particular piece of farm furniture and that, but uh, anything that relates to the farm, I like to collect and keep. On the wall, these are the chaps that hung over the hames, like on the horns right there, they hung over the, the hames. Basically, it was supposed to keep your lines and your spreader from getting hung up in your hames as much. This is a set of, of uh, mule bridles, mule harness, uh, got the gall wings or pigeon wings, whatever you want to call it, on the bridles right that. That was primarily used just for mules. This right here is a pack saddle. And they put this on basically a mule or a horse and that, and you put this over his uh, shoulders here and that, and uh, you tied your packs on this saddle right here. This row of shellers is predominantly John Deere shellers. Um, I rescued several of these out of, uh, in pieces and put them back together. And uh, this is an Economy 10 John Deere. I think it was sold out of St. Louis, Missouri here. Um, this is a new idea sheller right here. I'm a karmic. This is an old cast iron sheller. This is a pretty rare sheller right here. When you got your good ear, you throw those ears out, put them in that sack. You'd put them on one of those to dry it good, keep them away from the mice. And then since it was open pollinated, not hybrid, kind of what you saw is what you were going to get. Today, if you had hybrid corn, what you saw wouldn't be what you'd get. If you tried to replant hybrid corn, it would grow, but it wouldn't be anything like the parent stock would be. And then, now you had a Duke's mixture of kernels. The ones on the ends would be the rounds, and that the ones in the middle would primarily be flats, and the ones on the end would be kind of a, a Duke's mixture. Small rounds, large rounds, whatever. And that, then you'd run them through that grater, which is right there behind you, and that would basically separate them by size. You'd have your rounds, your flats, and that, and then you would, if you had a set of plates for one of those planters, you'd have a round plate, a flat plate, large rounds, small rounds. There was 50 different plates for each planter, and then you had your specialty corns like popcorn, sweet corn, that type of stuff. This ideal corn tester here has got 100 cells in it, and basically you put some type of heat and you put some cotton pads, put moisture on them, and that you have like a heat lamp down there and that are kept in a warm place. And if you had 99 of them grow or sprout, you had 99% germ. And most farmers back in the day, you, you sampled your own corn to see what the germination was because you raised it on your own farm, then maybe it was a year that you didn't have such good germination. So you generally ran a test like in February to see what your germination was to see, hey, this is corn I should keep her shouldn't keep, you know. This is a little later model John Deere Scheller, uh, uh, wood and cast iron, and that, that one over here, that number 10 is an early one, and the, the economy, uh, primarily made of wood. Um, this is a metal 1B. This is a sunshine sheller here. Uh, this is a diamond uh, two-hole sheller right here, and that, um, Another John Deere sheller here. Um, this is a clipper fan mill. You use this to clean your seed. If you were going to keep your seed beans, you'd put your seed in here and, and you'd run it with your hit and miss engine or some type of power. What's unique about this one, most of them you shovel the, the seed out of the bottom. This one actually has an elevator. The elevator to clean seed into your sacks. And you all could alternate the sacks on the go from one sack to the other one. Here's another type of uh, uh, seed cleaner right here, got different type of grates that go with it. And this right here is a very early 
thresh machine. This table goes down here on this end here, basically, and uh, basically you fed your your bundles of wheat in here like this. It had a spike cylinder in it, and if you look at it, it's basically just a miniature combine. This is a straw rack or straw walkers, like you'd have on a combine today, and uh, uh, a spike cylinder would wouldn't be a bit uncommon. To, the <coughs> southern combines use spikes and still use spikes yet today in that. This would be a horse drawn, one horse, single horse, John Deere cultivator. Another John Deere plow. This is a Chattanooga rollover plow right here. You just kick the pedal right there and that releases the latch and your mold board swings right over. I like to show it to people that are interested, who are primarily interested or remember it and have a real, a real feel for the fact that it's old or they used it when they were a kid or something like that, you know. A lot of the machinery comes in or the pieces come in that are in, are in bad shape. They need a lot of work, a lot of restoration and that. And uh, very little comes in here that looks like it does today. There's nothing I'd rather do, than, I guess, than go out there with a team of horses and rake hay. But uh, I have less than no patience, so <laughs> it won't happen. So predominantly, all we use the horses for is, is fun activities. You know, we, we go to some of these plowing events and steam shows, and uh, uh, I've worked with a couple different fairs on these relay races with horses, and that, you know, we've kind of put our own program together and I do several of those for different fairs and that. Uh, and that's generally in August when we're not so busy. And, and that's a good time, fun time we, we do with those. And, uh, uh, but as far as actually going out and farming, no, I don't. This is a McCormick Deering, primarily it's wheat or oat drill, but primarily it was used for wheat. And what you do with this drill is you'd go down between the rows of corn, it had these shields on the front, and you'd actually walk a, a mule <coughs> down between the rows, and you gotta remember rows in those days were 40 or 44 inches, and uh, it was a nasty job, but you did this <coughs> prior to harvesting the corn, that way when you harvested the corn off, shocked your corn, your wheat was already established, and that, so a lot of the farms, depending upon your area, had one of these. This is the same thing right here as a John Deere of Van Brunt, except it doesn't have the shields on it and that. But uh, uh, I talked to a couple farmers that had used them and that, and they said, you wore a raincoat and a rain hat regardless of the weather just to keep the corn leaves from cutting you to pieces. You had to have something over your face all the time. This is an apple cider press right here. These are wine barrels. Uh, this was a strainer. This was actually off of our, my, our family's wine press right here. It's been in the family for over 100 years and that. Uh, we use this for years to, to make wine. This is something that's quite unique right here. This is an iceless well cooler and that. And a lot of farmers just used a bucket and they crank it down the well to keep your cream or some of the goods you had in the house that it wouldn't fit in the ice box cool. But this basically was a, a, for that particular job, you kept your, your pie, your butter, your cream, milk, anything like that you wanted to keep cool. And this basically kept it at ground temperature because it was probably 25, 30 foot, not in the water, but right above the water. And uh, you cranked it up and down at mealtime to get what you needed out of your, basically your iceless cooler. And then uh, after lunch was over, you put it back in a well. Over here we have uh, wooden chicken coops, wooden or steel chicken feeders. Up above here we have brooder nests where basically you kept a set in hen with a nest full of eggs uh, so the coons wouldn't get them. Two different kinds of those right here. This is a harness vise right here. Basically you strapped your harness, the parts you're going to work in right up in here, you sat on it like this, that took the pressure off, you snapped them shut like this, and you worked on your harness where you were going to stitch it or rivet or whatever you're going to do. It's a harness vise. There's another butter churn there. Um, 
we can talk about this a little bit. This is a Loudon hay sling. And basically, when you had your hay wagon, you put a pair of these on the floor of the wagon, and you had your hay loader or you pitched it on by hand, and you filled your wagon up. And then when you got to the barn, you gathered up this hay sling and, that, and gathered up that hay, and you hooked it on a hook on a rope that was going to pull this big bundle of hay up into the barn. It got to the top. You brought it in on one of these track carriers right here, and then you tripped the one side of it. That opened up the sling, and it dropped down in a pile. You had the horse down on the ground, and he was pulling the rope that was pulling this bundle of hay up in the barn. And that was fine when he went forward like this, pulling on that rope, pulling on that rope. But when he got to the end of where he was going, and he was up in the barn, he had to back up. Well, normally you'd use a straight single tree. But this single tree right here attached to the bridging. So when he backed up, he didn't step on the single tree and mess up the rope. And that's what these are all about right here. Basically kept the single tree from dropping on the ground and the horse from stepping on it. These are pitmans, different pitmans for mowers. This is an old hand pump. Basically, you stuck this in a pond wherever you want to suck water from. And you, you pumped it out into whatever kind of, of a vessel you wanted to put it into. This right here is kind of unique. This is a rope maker. You attach five pieces of, of uh, twine, or a lot of people now use actually plastic twine. And uh, then you've got a little treadle that holds out here to keep them separated. And then somebody stands here and cranks it. And then when it comes out, it's, it's a perfect rope. And that they do a beautiful job. And that in there, pretty rare and collectible. This is a little pony sled back here. Wooden pony sled, bob sled, and that. We had a couple downstairs, but they're for horses a lot bigger and heavier. This is a bread mold here, I do know that. Basically, you put your dough in there and you knead it in that big wooden uh, tub there, and it's a bread mold. Oh, definitely, you know, and I deal with. The younger people I deal with today, I mean, they're, you know, very computer savvy and, and they want everything you can possibly get on a new piece of equipment, you know, in a line of computer equipment and, 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 and fancy stuff like that. Um, I'm not against it, but most of the stuff we farm with is, is larger equipment, but we don't have any auto steer or any of the, the fancy. It's still mechanical. It's, it's still mechanical. Traditional. Yeah. And, uh, I'm very involved with the problems, with all the automation, because I hear of everybody's problem. You know, if, <laughs> if it happens, yeah, I know about it. You know, and I guess that's another thing that turns me off. I just, when I get to the field, I just want to go. I don't need to be fancy. I don't have to lift something by hand, pull a lever rather than push a button. I just want it to work, and I want it to work all day, every day. You know, this is a 1900 John Deere two-seat. Surrey, it's pretty original, still got the original leather fenders on it, still got the original authentic guarantee sticker below the seat, made a genuine oak and hickory wood and, and guaranteed for a year against defects or faulty workmanship. This is some of the verification of it and that, but it certainly was out to be a 1900. It's an enclosed buggy here. We have three John Deere buggies here. This is a two seat, a single seat, and a single seat with a top. They're all Deers. This is a Lansing box, box wagon. This is a bird cell box wagon. Here, bird cell made several different things. We were well known for thrash machines 
and bird cell was very well known for its clover holler. They sold a lot, a lot of clo clover hollers. This is kind of unique right here. This is a livestock wagon. Basically, if you had hogs or sheep to haul and you had to get them to market, you needed a way to get them there. And basically, this is how you did it. You know, you run them in this end, it had a top on it so they couldn't jump out, and uh, you took them to market. And uh, haven't seen many of these at all. This is another belly dump dirt wagon. Pretty original yet. Most of the wood and the, and the fellows and the spokes and the hubs are all original on it yet. Basically, you kicked the lever here and tripped it and the bottom fell out and, and uh, you dumped your load of dirt or coal or gravel, whatever it was. This is a hay tether. And hay tethers aren't uncommon, but this one is uncommon because it's almost all totally wood. All the, the kicker arms on it are wooden. It's a wooden frame, a wooden tongue. And what's really unique about it is you use this lever right here and you're actually pulling the gear mechanism, the frame, into these bull gears on the wheel. And uh, it's very crude, but very simple and evidently worked very well. And, uh, This hay tether's over 100 years old, and for it still to be alive in this kind of condition speaks pretty well for itself, and uh, especially with the wood knot. It's very unusual. Okay, on the far end we have a spinning wheel, and that uh, basically uh, people used to take their wool from the sheep and, and spin it into yarn and then make all type of clothing and that with it. Um, after that we have a coffee grinder, a large coffee grinder. <clears throat> and then there's a butter churn. I think it was a 10 gallon butter churn there. And then we have a, an old horse drawn hand seeder. Following that there's an apple cider press. And that actually cut the apples up as well as, as squeezed them. And that. And uh, this is kind of a unique item here. This is a rollover pony plow. There's quite a few horse plows that roll over, but this is a rollover pony plow. And it's almost in brand new shape yet. And then we got this old, very primitive wooden fork right here. And uh, next to it here, we have a copper still in that for making your favorite beverage. Basically, I like to remember it as it was when I was a kid, you know, with, I don't care if it was a stove out of the house, if it was a wood-fired stove, you know, an old, old fan, an old, old chandelier, old butchering equipment, or anything like that that was, that was related to the farm. I'm not a big furniture collector, unless it was a particular piece of farm furniture and that, but uh, anything that relates to the farm, I like to collect and keep. Tom doesn't operate a public museum with its accompanying operating rules and regulations. We are grateful he opened it up for us to see and share with our rural heritage viewers. We have produced a compilation DVD for sale that includes the three episodes we have shown of Tom's collection. For ordering information, please call 
or visit www.ruralheritage.com. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging, as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of back-to-the-land books, DVDs, and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information. Or visit our website at www.ruralheritage.com.